One of the awesome parts about doing application development with Vue is that there's a really cool debugging tool that you can use to help figure out what's going on in your applications. So I'm going to just use the same single page app that we were using earlier, and I want to show you how to find these debugging tools. So if you go to the, I'm using Chrome here, so if you go to actually, I'm using Brave, which is based on Chromium, just like Chrome is, so it uses the same extensions. Uh, if you go to the Chrome Web Store, you can find it uh, as Vue.js DevTools. Um, you can also uh, get to here from the main Vue page. So Vue.js.org has all of the Vue stuff, including all the documentation. And then under Ecosystem here, you can go to DevTools. And this is actually going to take us to a GitHub page, which is where the DevTools live. They're all open source, of course. And if you scroll down here, you can see that there's versions of this debugging toolkit for Chrome and related browsers. If you're a Firefox user, you can also get a Firefox add-on. And if you're using some other browser, like Edge or Opera or something, you can get just a standalone Electron app, and that will work with pretty much any environment at all. So I'm using Brave, which is derived from Chromium, so I'm going to just use the Chrome extension. So you just install that like you would with any other Chrome extension. What you'll see is that this little view logo is grayed out because Vue isn't running in this in this context. Whereas if I go to an application that's based on Vue, then you can see that the view logo is actually highlighted because that's what we're uh, what we're running inside this application. Now, if you click on that, it's not super helpful. It just says it's detected, uh, but that's not how you actually access it. You've got to go to your development tool page. So in Chrome, you go to More Tools and then hit Developer Tools, or what I like to do is just use the shortcut key. You see that the Developer Tools window opens up and you've got the usual things like your console and your network information and so forth. But there's gonna be a new tab here now after you install the Vue extension that will give us access to Vue. Now you remember in the application itself, we had a top-level object, a top-level component called app. And this little tree here is showing us the structure of our application. I can use this reveal triangle to drill down in there. vApp was the Vuetify application component that we had at the top level of our application. I can drill into that. And now we can see the three main components that make up our app. We've got the nav bar at the top, and you can see over here it highlights that information as you as you um, hover over these guys. So navbar, then the content, the main body of the page, and then the footer. So you can, first of all, just see the structure of your application and how these different components line up with one another. Let's go take a look at the navbar. We can drill down into this. And then we see here's the, here's the, the various buttons. So there's the sign up button, the sign in button, the about us button. And we can also look at the state of the component. In other words, we can see what's in the, in the data that's part of the component. We can see the value of computed columns and so forth by just clicking on the, the component. Remember the navbar component that we defined, right? We created a new component just called navbar. And inside that component, we had this is logged in function that keeps track of whether or not there's somebody currently logged into the application. And if you recall from the description of the client side of this app, the is logged in was actually a function based on the global state information that's con contained in Vuex. And we'll see that we can also browse that global state information here in a second. But let me just show you how this would work. I'm gonna sign in with an existing account. And before I click log in here, keep an eye down here on the value of that computed property. You can see that as soon as I log in, and behind the scenes I would have sent the request to the server, validated against the database, gotten a response back that says that I was good to go, and that result of that would have been for the global state information to change, and that's because that's reactive data, it's reflected here in the value of this is logged in computed property. And of course, because we had written our nav bar to be sensitive to that particular value, now it's showing this drop down with my login name and some other actions that I can do once I've authenticated. And I'm going to do the opposite operation here and sign out. And again, keep an eye on 
the is logged in value down here. So I hit sign out. And now you can see that that switches back to false because behind the scenes, the code had run the mutation on the global state object, that Vuex state, to set the current user to be null. Let's take a look at what's going on below this in that global state store, the Vuex store. I'm gonna just reload the application here to kind of start from scratch with no state information stored. And instead of looking at the components here, which is what this tab gives you, you can just look at components, I'm gonna to switch to looking at the contents of our Vuex store. So again, because Vuex is part of the Vue ecosystem developed by the same people, and they also produce this debugger, uh, you can actually look at the state of Vuex directly from inside of these dev tools. What this view is gonna show us is sort of a history of changes that are being made to the store. Remember that we can't read and write directly the state information that's stored in that store.js file. We're gonna invoke mutations which are then behind the scenes gonna make those changes to the, the various state values. So the fact that we have to go through that mutation process gives Vue a chance to sort of control access to that global state, but it also allows the debugger to hook into that process and show when and how those changes get made. So the base state is just our initial value, right? We had the state variable that had current account, and that was initialized to null because that's how we indicate that no user is currently logged in. And then there was also a getter that interpreted this current account to give back a true or false value based on whether or not this was null or an object that contained user information. And it's this getter that the navbars is logged in function was using to determine whether or not to show the logged in navbar or not. Okay, so let's now keeping an eye on this state information, let's sign in again. Okay, now again, keep an eye on the changes that are gonna happen down here in the contents of our global state, as well as the uh, new mutation that's gonna be added. So I'm gonna click log in. And you can see a whole bunch of things took place here, right? The first of those is that we moved from this base state, which was just the initialized values at the beginning of the execution, um, to now we've executed a mutation called login. And you remember that that was the name of the function that we gave in the mutation section of the Vuex store. And its behavior was to update the value of the current account. Well, we get down here in the, the details of this mutation, we can see that the mutation itself had a payload that was the object that we, we handed to the login function. And this was none other than the object that we got back in the response to our request to the server to validate our login, right? So this is all coming straight from the server. And then we also have a type here for this mutation that conforms to the name of the function that's gonna be invoked to actually store this information. You notice though that the current value that's being shown here for the state isn't reflecting that change. And that's because we've, although we've seen this login take place, the debugger allows us to kind of wait to apply these mutations until we're ready to see the effect that they have. So if I hover over here, you can see that there's this commit button. And when I hit this guy, it'll actually change the display down here to now say that the current account is that object. And you'll notice that because this is no longer null, the is logged in getter is returning true, which has percolated up reactively to the navbar object to show that the current user is logged in. Let me show you a logout. So I'm gonna do a sign out here. And you can see that now we've got a logout mutation that's been logged. And we've got our payload was just the invocation of the logout function. There's no, there's no content associated with that. And then our current state is about to be modified to reflect that. So if we hit commit here, we'll go back to this null state. Let me do that again. Oops. Here's the login. And then I'm gonna just go ahead and do a sign out. And notice that now we have both of these mutation invocations that are listed here in the, in the list of mutations. 
What's kind of cool about this is that you can move back and forth through time here to figure out what happened at any of these stages by just clicking on the mutation, which is really handy. And when you're, when you're ready to uh, apply a particular mutation, you can just click the mutation button and that will advance the state forward to that point. Now you notice that after I committed those things, it actually rolled the global state forward both to the login that I did and then to the log out that I did. And the end result of that is that I'm back in a logged out state. What I want to do now is a sign up. And I want to focus attention here instead of on the nav bar, I want to look at the the content and here's the sign up page. So this was the page component that we created to do signing up. You can see that it gives us some information about the, the uh, router logic to say that you're currently on the sign up page. But if I click on this now, down here in the details view, we'll see all of the state information associated with that sign up component. So we have this new member information that corresponds to the, the uh, bindings to these text boxes. We've got our validators. We've got this valid flag that says whether or not the validators are currently passing, which obviously they're not. And then we've got the dialogue information here for that pop-up that gives us confirmation about whether or not the sign-up worked out. So let's go in here and, here and start filling out this form. And as I'm typing up here, again, keep an eye on the state information down here. So if I fill out Fred, you notice that as I'm typing, the debugger is showing the contents of the data that's bound to this control. And if I go here to Ziffle, you'll see that the last name datum is now updating as I'm typing things in up here. You can also actually influence the contents of the user interface from the debugging tool. So if I go in here to the email field and click the edit button, I can now put in a JavaScript constant like fred at ziffle.com. And when I hit the save button, you'll notice that it changes to update the user interface. Just like the property here inside this new member object is bound to this form field, the same thing obtains here in the debugging view. I make a change here, it's reflected in the data. When I make a change to the data, it's reflected in the, in the field. And then finally, I'll type in um, a password. This is really helpful when you're debugging a field that doesn't display its content because you can still see here in the password field that's bound to this text edit, the thing that you're actually typing in. So I'll continue to super secret 42. You can see here that the, the sign up button is now enabled. Let me back out of the, the two digits that I put in here. So now the password is no longer passing validation. And in order for the sign up button to be enabled, everything has to be valid. But because this is not passing validation, you see that I've got valid equals false. That was the model object that I had bound to the form itself. And when I type in now some digits to satisfy the validators, you can see that this changes to true and that sign up button is enabled for me to be able to sign up. Now I'm intentionally putting in an address that's already in the database because I want to show you kind of how the uh, the dialog box works relative to the debugger. Uh, so click that. I've already got an account with zipfred at ziffle.com. So these are, these are the elements in the dialog box. And you can see over here that when I opened this dialog box based on the response that came back from the server, I was setting the header to the value sorry because I got an error response back. I've got this text message that I created on the server side um, based on the fact that there was already an email there. And then after I had set those things here on the, on the client, I set the dialog visible value to true, which causes this dialog box to pop up. And if I hit OK here, what you'll see is that the dialog box visible is going to be set to false. That's the behavior associated with clicking on this button. And because that gets set to false, it therefore pops the dialog box back down because it's dependent on this visible flag to show it, show or hide itself. So I'm gonna hit okay. You can see that that goes away and the dialog visible changes to false. Notice that it didn't automatically update these other values. I elected not to, to clear those out. They'd certainly be possible to do that if you wanted to sort of return this to a pristine state when you close the dialog box. But since the user can't really see these things anyway, 
as long as this thing is set to false, um, it, it doesn't really make any difference what these have. Now let me um, put in a different email address, uh, Fred17, click the sign up button again. Now you can see I got a, a success message back from the server that's reflected in the state here in the dialog header in the dialog text. The vet box is currently popped open and when I hit OK, it's going to change this to be false and the box will go away. And in addition, if you go back and look at the code for the sign up page, you'll see that when I do pop this box down, if I was dealing with a successful creation of an account, I'll also do a redirect to send the user back to the home page. And there we are. Now, since I'm back at the home page, um, there's not any state really associated with this object. So I can still click around inside the component list, but for the for the home page itself, there really isn't any information that's there. Except for this uh, this dollar route. Remember that variables that start with a dollar sign in a view application are reflective of kind of internal state in view itself. So if I drill down and does this, I can see the details of that of the current route. So it tells me like what my path is, what, what the name was for this route in the view router definitions. Uh, so you can actually access that kind of internal state as well. Some other things that you can do here in the, in the developer toolbar, switch to events. This can be really helpful if you're trying to figure out uh, how a particular component is responding to input from the user. So let me, let me just clear this for the time being here. And now I'm going to start clicking around on here. So click the sign up button. You can see that there was a whole variety of events that got created by that event that I just clicked on. And you can go back and, and look at the details of the event. So here's a change event. Here's an input event. Uh, the click event itself, right? I can see that it's a click event. I can know what sort of a component was being clicked. You can look at the details of the event itself. So that can be really helpful to sort of figure out what's going on as you move through the application. When I start typing in here, you see that I got a mouse down in this field and then a focus on that field and then a mouse up, but the cursor is still there. So if I start typing things in here, things in here, you can see that I get a whole bunch of key down input events that are being tracked by view to update the, the HTML component on the page and to update the underlying state. Uh, but you can follow along with this in a lot of detail if you so desire. We have a, a routing display. Remember that as we move from page to page, we're using the view router class to be able to synchronize the browser state with the single page application state. Let me clear this guy out here to start fresh. If I go back to my main page, you can see that we navigated to the default route and its name in the configuration object was home page. And if I go to sign up, I see this a similar kind of navigation or sign in or about us or back to home, right? So you can follow along the specific path that you went through the application. And you also get complete information about where were you and where did you go just now? So right now we're at the home page, And if I click sign up, we can see I went from the home page to the sign up page. And you can actually do quite a lot in the router to do things like verification that you're allowed to navigate to a new spot or to see where you came from to change the behavior of the application if, you like, if you'd like to do that. And this allows you to kind of see a, a lot more clearly what's been happening behind the scenes. And then there's some settings that you can apply to change the way the debugger itself is operating. Most of the time you're going to spend here in the component view uh, or possibly in the view X view, uh, but the component view is probably the most common because really making a view app is largely about creating components that allow your user to interact with your application in a rich way. And as you're developing those components, this is going to be the most helpful portion of the debugging tools.